Hi. <laughs> um, as she makes her way up here. It is a joy to present to you our next presenter. Um, Xiao Chen and I met two years ago, and we bonded instantly over a shared passion for dance. She's a dancer, and I'm myself a dancer. But um, she's much more than that, as I've come to know her and love her. She is a genuine, pure, real embodiment of complete kindness and generosity, love, and compassion. If I was ever having a bad day, she was always there to offer me a hug, and I mean like a real hug, like <laughs> love and eye contact afterwards, and, <laughs> and, and everything. She exudes complete compassion. If any of us ever did, she was the one that was the complete embodiment of that. So I am um, sure she's going to leave a mark on all of you just as she's left a mark on me. So, welcome, Xiao Chen. Hello, everyone. First, I wanted to give my deepest thanks to Chris, Lari, Omila, Niranjin, Anna, Sarah, and Dermo. Thank you so much. My lovely cohort. I love you guys. <laughs> um, okay. So, as a Vipassion meditator for many years, I've had many profound mystical experiences. One instance happened days after, three days after I came back from the 10 day silent retreat years ago. The night at home, my mom had some criticism for me I was, as I was walking upstairs. Suddenly, I felt her words turning into a vertical wave with hundreds and thousands of specks, the same height as me, and coming at me. This wave came to me so fast, for a millisecond, it was already halfway penetrating through my torso, especially my heart. Subtle yet vivid. With the strong awareness I caught of it the, from the meditation, I was able to bounce it all out of me like, like a Tai Chi movement. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so I did not react, just kept on walking upstairs like nothing happened. So that experience made me realize that I live in a two dimensional world simultaneously the gross one and the subtle one. And I also realized that the strong awareness works in a subtle level that can block out mental negativities even before it affects me. So it kind of looked like that. <laughs> <laughs> and last summer, after the Indian trip with my cohort, I set off for Thailand for uh, the practice. Here I practiced in a mountain cave and alone. So after that, I spent two weeks in a jungle type of a monastery. <laughs> it was a daily struggle um, to deal with my fear face to face. The fear had never been so real. So when I came back to my familiar environment, my mind naturally compares my new experiences to my old patterns of behaviors. I could suddenly pick up people's fears around me, especially my parents, that sometimes frustrated me a little bit. <laughs> and, but most importantly, I could see my own fear in my own thought process, such as uh, my fear reasoning why I should choose this notebook over the other one. But can you imagine much bigger things than that? <laughs> they are fear motivated. So, this fear motivation was, is extremely subtle and deceptive. So I could see how my fear manifests my reality. Oops. Again, this March, 
I went back to Thailand and um, had a meditation retreat. When I came back, I noticed that many of my attachments that I held dearly started loosening, loosening up and spontaneously. I did not force it. It felt like the white strings that tied to my fingertips become like smoke, long and thin. Um, do you know who usually have strings on their fingertips? Puppets. Yeah. So, <laughs> so my attachment, I was the uh, puppies among my attachments. And, and my attachment is my boss, and I was the servant. Mm -hmm. And does that mean the reality I had before the meditation is not my definite reality? Does that also mean I had a consciousness shift? Um, so my, reali my reality does not necessarily 100% resonate with my way of being. Oh yeah, push wrong side. <laughs> so Descartes says, I think, therefore I am. When this fear, this attachment, was strongly holding on to me in my thought process, then that manifests my reality. And that's quite natural. It's a natural inclination for people to do like that. But what if I become aware of my fear and my attachment? Ajahn says, who I am, who am I when I don't think I am who I think I am? <laughs> do, do you get it? <laughs> <laughs> who am I when I don't think I am who I think I am? <laughs> so this process is not who I really am. I am not my fear. I am not my attachment. I am not my doubt. Who am I then? Tatwa Asi, which is a verse from Chandogya Upanishad, translates as though are that, refers to the essence of a being. To know such essence of oneself indicates knowing who you are. In another way to say it, who am I? I'm, I am that, but, so what is that? So that's the first question. Second question, why is that so important? Let me answer the second one first. <laughs> so I just says, if we do not know who we are, how can we function in this world? And consequently, how we would not know our purpose or our best intention should be. If we know who we are, why we are here, then we can take the best advantage of ourselves, in short, spend our life not only for ourselves, but also for others. And for the first question, we have to dig a little bit more. Um, see. So here are some peaches in front of you. What are you aware of the peach at this moment? What did you see? The red color, the wrong shape, or the smell of the delicious peach right off the tree? It must taste so sweet. Maybe adding a little bit sour is even better. Um, maybe it's very soft to touch. So this we call it external sense data of the peach. Simultaneously, your internal sense data is at work too. You might feel pleasant to look at the color and the pleasant to smell it. You might desire to touch it and, or pick one to taste it. You might want to compare your mind. Maybe this one is bigger than that one or that one is maybe a little bit more round, more red, so you could choose which one you want to pick. You want to choose the biggest one, the most red and the most uh, delicious one, right? And, um, but wait, what if, um, what if it has pesticide on it? <laughs> Can I really eat it? Am I allowed to pick it up from the tree? What if I get caught? Guess what? You're doubting now. <laughs> so you might feel frustrated. Maybe, 
oh, maybe I should just go to 7-Eleven to grab a peach iced tea instead. <laughs> 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 Do you know the train of thought you just had in your mind? So this desires, this pleasant feeling turning into unpleasant feeling, this doubting, this frustration, so are examples of internal sense data. They reside in your thought process. That's what's going on through your mind at the moment. So they're called mental factors or dharmas in Abhidharma Buddhism. There's about 20 or more of them are present in your consciousness every moment. How many of them can you pick it up? Like two? <laughs> <laughs> And again, similar to the manufacturers, there are eight bhavas in a classical Samkhya system. Bhavas reside in the mind or intellect of Prakriti, Prakriti, which is the primordial nature. So my thesis is to compare and contrast the manufacturers from both systems, the Abhidharma system and the Samkhya system. Specifically, how the different categories of the manufacturers the Abhidharmas fall under each power. For example, the last one, Anaisvaryam, which is weakness, I would match it with the Dharmas, which would be carelessness, pramada, no face, asrada, and sloth, stiana. So, the Bhavas that you just saw, all those qualities, they, fall, they all have three um, qualities, which are called the trigunas which is tamas at the root at the bottom, or the rajas, the middle part, or the flowers, lotus flower, you see that's a sattva. And the quality of the tamas usually is inertia, darkness, and concealing, and heavy, and rajas usually stimulates, moves, and changes. And sattva is light, luminous, and harmony, or equilibrium. So when the three, interact between the three gunas, it causes the fluctuation of the mental activities. That's why you have all this thought process. When the three gunas are in equilibrium, then the tamas shift to sattva state, which helps the rajas, uh, which with the help of rajas as catalyst, then the mental factors are at rest. What does that mean? It means that the fear, the attachment, are not active anymore, <coughs> are not controlling your mind, like the attachment control me, like a puppy. So in meditation, um, that's, we call it uh, samatha, which is the state of stillness. Mm -hmm. Similarly, the manufacturers, according to the natural inclination of the Abhidharma, like mm, the Buddha, in the Buddhist, um, the Buddhist one, they, are, they can also be interpreted through the, these guna theories. In both systems, there is one particular, particular manufacturers can be transcended uh, through the entire mental experience. In Abhidharma, it's the wisdom or the insight. Prajna in Sanskrit, Panya in Pali. So I, after the mind is still through the concentration meditation, you want to concentrate, focus first, then the prajna arises, the wisdom, to penetrate through the mind, purify all the unrestful mentality. Just like a dirt in the muddy water finally sinks to the bottom of the glass, so you can see the th these things as they are with lum luminous clarity. So the rising of the wisdom is through the contemplation of the three marks of existence, which is dukkha for suffering, anicca for impermanence, and anatta for non-self. Specifically, when the manufacturers are penetrated by awareness, which is through meditation, so the characteristics of no-self become apparent in its true nature. So the realization is essential amongst all three marks of existence. And we call it enlightenment. Similar to the prajna, it takes knowledge, jnana, to discern all those modes of bhavas. When the tamas transforms, you know, the tamas were at the bottom um, of the lotus, 
when transforms to a sadhwa, the lotus flower. So jnana, which is a knowledge, the manufacturers is filled with sattva, with luminous, then with the right view from the witness, you see the eye, which is purusha, the purpose become apparent, then the discernment will happen. When they separate, you'll see the distinction, there, here's the viveka, which means the discernment. So that's the Sankhya system of enlightenment. And meditation, specifically vipassana or inside meditation, is the key to cultivate wisdom or knowledge so that the manufacturers are at its rest, at its restful state indefinitely. Let me give you an example. When you are looking at the delicious peaches, you might desire to get one like that. This is attachment, which is raga. And important manufacturers exist in both bhavas and dhammas. And these ragas of clinging to the pleasure and the sensation might put one into frustration or anger. But at the same time, if one is able to be aware of those subtle sensations and penetrate it with wisdom, then one can transcend oneself. Because a raga, you can see it as passion or love could be seen. It can be seen in both good and bad. Similarly, each of these mental states, like this fear and attachment, can be used for the purpose, either for enlightenment or for deepened ignorance. Mm -hmm. So that means you can use it both ways. It depends on you. It takes two steps. You can shift from the tamas, the root, and to the sattva, the flower, in terms of mental state. And and the second step is to have the uh, penetration of the mind through the wisdom. So, the answer to who am I lies in the realization of naham nasmi name, which is I am not, nothing is mine, there is no I. That's the ultimate realization. <laughs> Just, by the way, when you look at this, what manufacturers do you have right now? <laughs> the color of the cookie or <laughs> so you're having some ginger cookies on your table. Please pick one and um, take a moment when you put it in your mouth. Think about what's going through in your, in your mind right now. Eat a cookie and contemplate. <laughs> Questions? I just want to comment. Yes. And you did such a beautiful job of taking that mass divinity of your thesis into a presentation in its clarity. So those mental factors were clearly subject. So thank, <laughs> thank you so much, Laurie. <laughs> yes, our Buddhist professor. No. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Thomas. Thomas. <laughs> Really great, uh, brilliant presentation. Thank you. Um, I'm assuming, I'm guessing, are you using Sevasti Varden, Abhidharma, or so? Yes. Um, it's kind of going beyond the presentation a little bit, uh, so I don't want to make it too long of a question. But um, the Sevasti Vardens are very um, unique among mm -hmm. the Abhidharma schools in that they have this theories uh, that the dharmas never go in and out of existence. Mm -hmm. And they're the only school who, who actually believe this. Mm -hmm. um, so, does that come into your thesis at all? Do you deal with this kind of problem? Because this was kind of a, interestingly, a, a, a route to, to Mahayana Buddhism, which ends up denying the reality of all dharmas as, as, as objects of the mind. So, do you deal with this? or? I only deal with the Savastivada okay. Buddhism. 
So do you deal with their Dharma theory in comparison to other Dharma theories, or how does this work? I, I, I compare to the classical Sankhya of Isvara Krishna, which okay. is the Guna theories. All right. <laughs> Yeah, the gunas, the tamas, the rajas, and the satwa compared to that. Okay. Any more questions?